the chimney corner by harriet beecher stowe published in eighteen sixty eight this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org this recording by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana in january two thousand twenty the chimney corner chapter one what will you do with her or the woman question well what will you do with her said i to my wife my wife had just come down from an interview with a pale faded-looking young woman in rusty black attire who had called upon me on the very common supposition that i was an editor of the atlantic monthly by the by this is a mistake that brings me christopher crowfield many letters that do not belong to me and which might with equal pertinency be addressed to the man in the moon yet these letters often make my heart ache they speak so of people who strive and sorrow and want help and it is hard to be called on in plaintive tones for help which you know it is perfectly impossible for you to give for instance you get a letter in a delicate hand setting forth the old distress she is poor and she has looking to her for support those that are poorer and more helpless than herself she has tried sewing but can make little at it tried teaching but cannot now get a school all places being filled and more than filled at last has tried literature and written some little things of which she sends you a modest specimen and wants your opinion whether she can gain her living by writing you run over the articles and perceive at a glance that there is no kind of hope or use in her trying to do anything at literature and then you ask yourself mentally what is to be done with her what can she do such was the application that had come to me this morning only instead of by note it came as i have said in the person of the applicant a thin delicate consumptive-looking being wearing that rusty mourning which speaks sadly at once of heart bereavement and material poverty my usual course is to turn such cases over to mrs crowfield and it is to be confessed that this worthy woman spends a large portion of her time and wears out an extraordinary amount of shoe leather in performing the duties of a self-constituted intelligence office talk of giving money to the poor <laughs> what is that compared to giving sympathy thought time taking their burdens upon you sharing their perplexities they who are able to buy off every application at the door of their heart with a five or ten dollar bill are those who free themselves at least expense my wife had communicated to our friend in the gentlest tones and in the blandest manner that her poor little pieces however interesting to her own household circle had nothing in them wherewith to enable her to make her way in the thronged and crowded thoroughfare of letters that they had no more strength or adaptation to win bread for her than a broken-winged butterfly to draw a plough and it took some resolution in the background of her tenderness to make the poor applicant entirely certain of this in cases like this absolute certainty is the very greatest the only true kindness it was grievous my wife said to see the discouraged shade which passed over her thin tremulous features when this certainty forced itself upon her it is hard when sinking in the waves to see the frail bush at which the hand clutches uprooted hard when alone in the crowded thoroughfare of travel to have one's last banknote declared a counterfeit i knew i should not be able to see her face under the shade of this disappointment and so coward that i was i turned this trouble where i have turned so many others upon my wife well what shall we do with her said i i really don't know said my wife musingly do you think we could get that school in tonton for her impossible mr hebert told me he had already twelve applicants for it couldn't you get her plain sewing is she handy with her needle she has tried that but it brings on a pain in her side and cough and the doctor has told her it will not do for her to confine herself how is her handwriting does she write a good hand only passable because said i i was thinking if i could get steele and simpson to give her law papers to copy 
they have more copyists than they need now and in fact this woman does not write the sort of hand at all that would enable her to get on as a copyist well said i turning uneasily in my chair and at last hitting on a bright masculine expedient i'll tell you what must be done she must get married my dear said my wife marrying for a living is the very hardest way a woman can take to get it even marrying for love often turns out badly enough witness poor jane jane was one of the large number of people whom it seemed my wife's fortune to carry through life on her back she was a pretty smiling pleasing daughter of erin who had been in our family originally as nursery maid i had been greatly pleased in watching the little idyllic affair growing up between her and the joyous good-natured young irishman to whom at last we married her mike soon after however took to drinking and unsteady courses and the result has been to jane only a yearly baby with poor health and no money in fact said my wife if jane had only kept single she could have made her own way well enough and might have now been in good health and had a pretty sum in the savings bank as it is i must carry not only her but her three children on my back you ought to drop her my dear you really ought not to burden yourself with other people's affairs as you do said i inconsistently how can i drop her can i help knowing that she is poor and suffering and if i drop her who will take her up now there is a way of getting rid of cases of this kind spoken of in a quaint old book which occurred strongly to me at that moment Quote, if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food and one of you say unto them depart in peace and be ye warmed and filled notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body what doth it profit End quote i must confess notwithstanding the strong point of the closing question i looked with an evil eye of longing on this very easy way of disposing of such cases a few sympathizing words a few expressions of hope that i did not feel a line written to turn the case into somebody else's hands any expedient in fact to hide the longing eyes and the imploring hands from my sight was what my carnal nature at this moment greatly craved besides said my wife resuming the thread of her thoughts in regard to the subject just now before us as to marriage it's out of the question at present for this poor child for the man she loved and would have married lies low in one of the graves before richmond it's a sad story one of a thousand like it she brightened for a few moments and looked almost handsome when she spoke of his bravery and goodness her father and lover had both died in this civil war her only brother had returned from it a broken-down cripple and she has him and her poor old mother to care for and so she seeks work i told her to come again to-morrow and i would look about for her a little to-day let me see how many are now down on your list to be looked about for mrs crowfield some twelve or thirteen are there not you've got tom's sister disposed of finally i hope that's a comfort well i'm sorry to say she came back on my hands yesterday said my wife patiently she's a foolish young thing and she didn't like living out in the country i'm sorry because the morrises are an excellent family and she might have had a life home there if she had only been steady and chosen to behave herself properly but yesterday i found her back on her mother's hands again and the poor woman told me that the dear child never could bear to be separated from her and that she hadn't the heart to send her back and in short said i she gave you notice that you must provide for miss o'connor and in some more agreeable way cross that name off your list at any rate that woman and girl need a few hard raps in the school of experience before you can do anything for them i think i shall said my long-suffering wife but it's a pity to see a young thing put in the direct road to ruin it is one of the inevitables said i and we must save our strength for those that are willing to help themselves what's all this talk about said bob coming in on us rather brusquely oh as usual the old question said i what's to be done with her well said bob it's exactly what i've come to talk with mother about 
since she keeps a distressed woman's agency office i have come to consult her about mary ann that woman will die before six months are out a victim to high civilization and the patties there we are twelve miles out from boston in a country villa so convenient that every part of it might almost do its own work everything arranged in the most convenient contiguous self-adjusting self-acting patent right perfective manner and yet i tell you marianne will die of that house it will yet be recorded on her tombstone died of conveniences <laughs> for myself what i languish for is a log cabin with a bed in one corner a trundle bed underneath for the children a fireplace only six feet off a table four chairs one kettle a coffee-pot and a tin baker that's all i lived deliciously in an establishment of this kind last summer when i was up at lake superior and i am convinced if i could move mary ann into it at once that she would become a healthy and a happy woman her life is smothered out of her with comforts we have too many rooms too many carpets too many vases and knick-knacks too much china and silver she has too many laces and dresses and bonnets the children all have too many clothes in fact to put it scripturally our riches are corrupted our garments are moth-eaten our gold and our silver is cankered and in short mary ann is sick in bed and i have come to the agency office for distressed women to take you out to attend to her the fact is continued bob that since our cook married and alice went to california there seems to be no possibility of putting our domestic cabinet upon any permanent basis the number of female persons that have been through our house and the ravages they have wrought on it for the last six months pass belief i had yesterday a bill of sixty dollars plumbing to pay for damages of various kinds which had had to be repaired in our very convenient waterworks and the blame of each particular one had been bandied like a shuttlecock among our three household divinities biddy privately assured my wife that kate was in the habit of emptying dustpans of rubbish into the main drain from the chambers and washing any little extra bits down through the bowls and in fact when one of the bathing-room bowls had overflowed so as to damage the frescoes below my wife with great delicacy and precaution interrogated kate as to whether she had followed her instructions in the care of the water pipes of course she protested the most immaculate care and circumspection sure and she knew how careful one ought to be and wasn't of the likes of them as wouldn't mind what trouble they made like biddy who would throw trash and hair in the pipes and never listen to her tellin sure and hadn't she broken the pipes in the kitchen and lost the stoppers as it was a shame to see in a christian house and the third girl being privately questioned blamed biddy on monday and kate on tuesday on wednesday however she exonerated both but on thursday being in a high quarrel with both she departed accusing them severally not only of all the evil practices aforesaid but of lying and stealing and all other miscellaneous wickednesses that came to hand whereat the two thus accused rushed in bewailing themselves and cursing anne in alternate strophes averring that she had given the baby laudanum and taking it out riding had stopped for hours with it in a filthy lane where the scarlet fever was said to be rife in short made so fearful a picture that marianne gave up the child's life at once and is taken to her bed i have endeavoured all i could to quiet her by telling her that the scarlet fever story was probably an extemporaneous work of fiction got up to gratify the hibernian anger at anne and that it wasn't in the least worth while to believe one thing more than another from the fact that any of the tribe said it but she refuses to be comforted and is so utopian as to lie there crying oh if i only could get one that i could trust one that really would speak the truth to me one that i might know really went where she said she went and really did as she said she did to have to live so she says and bring up little children with those she can't trust out of her sight whose word is good for nothing 
to feel that her beautiful house and her lovely things are all going to wreck and ruin and she can't take care of them and can't see where or when or how the mischief is done in short the poor child talks as women do who are violently attacked with housekeeping fever tending to congestion of the brain she actually yesterday told me that she wished on the whole she never had got married which i take to be the most positive indication of mental alienation here said i we behold at this moment two women dying for the want of what they can mutually give one another each having a supply of what the other needs but held back by certain invisible cobwebs slight but strong from coming to each other's assistance Marianne has money enough, but she wants a helper in her family, such as all her money has been hitherto unable to buy, and here, close at hand, is a woman who wants home shelter, healthy, varied, active, cheerful labor, with nourishing food, kind care, and good wages. What hinders these women from rushing to help one another, just as two drops of water on a leaf rush together and make one? Nothing but a miserable prejudice, but a prejudice so strong that women will starve in any other mode of life rather than accept competency and comfort in this you don't mean said my wife to propose that our protege should go to marianne as a servant i do say it would be the best thing for her to do the only opening that i see and a very good one too it is just look at it her bare living at this moment cannot cost her less than five or six dollars a week everything at the present time is so very dear in the city now by what possible calling open to her capacity can she pay her board and washing fuel and lights and clear a hundred and some odd dollars a year she could not do it as a district school teacher she certainly cannot with her feeble health do it by plain sewing she could not do it as a copyist a robust woman might go into a factory and earn more but factory work is unintermitted twelve hours a day week in and out in the same movement in close air amid the clatter of machinery and a person delicately organized soon sinks under it it takes a stolid enduring temperament to bear factory labor now look at marianne's house and family and see what is insured to your protege there in the first place a home a neat quiet chamber quite as good as she has probably been accustomed to the very best of food served in a pleasant light airy kitchen which is one of the most agreeable rooms in the house and the table and table service quite equal to those of most farmers and mechanics then her daily tasks would be light and varied some sweeping some dusting the washing and dressing of children the care of their rooms and the nursery all of it the most healthful the most natural work of a woman work alternating with rest and diverting thought from painful subjects by its variety and what is more a kind of work in which a good christian woman might have satisfaction as feeling herself useful in the highest and best way for the child's nurse if she be a pious well-educated woman may make the whole course of nursery life and education in goodness then what is far different from many other modes of gaining a livelihood a woman in this capacity can make and feel herself really and truly beloved the hearts of little children are easily gained and their love is real and warm and no true woman can become the object of it without feeling her own life made brighter again she would have in marianne a sincere warm-hearted friend who would care for her tenderly respect her sorrows shelter her feelings be considerate of her wants and in every way aid her in the cause she has most at heart the succor of her family there are many ways besides her wages in which she would infallibly be assisted by marianne so that the probability would be that she could send her little salary almost untouched to those for whose support she was toiling all this on her part but added my wife on the other hand she would be obliged to associate and be ranked with common irish servants well i answered is there any occupation by which any of us gain our living which has not its disagreeable side 
does not the lawyer spend all his days either in a dusty office or in the foul air of a courtroom is he not brought into much disagreeable contact with the lowest class of society are not his labors dry and hard and exhausting does not the blacksmith spend half his life in soot and grime that he may gain a competence for the other half if this woman were to work in a factory would she not often be brought into associations distasteful to her might it not be the same in any of the arts and trades in which a living is to be got there must be unpleasant circumstances about earning a living in any way only i maintain that those which a woman would be likely to meet with as a servant in a refined well-bred christian family would be less than in almost any other calling are there no trials to a woman i beg to know in teaching a district school where all the boys big and little of the neighborhood congregate for my part were it my daughter or sister who was in necessitous circumstances i would choose for her a position such as i name in a kind intelligent christian family before many of those to which women do devote themselves well said bob all this has a good sound enough but it's quite impossible it's true i verily believe that such a kind of servant in our family would really prolong marianne's life years that it would improve her health and be an unspeakable blessing to her to me and the children and i would almost go down on my knees to a really well-educated good american woman who would come into our family and take that place but i know it's perfectly vain and useless to expect it you know we have tried the experiment two or three times of having a person in our family who should be on the footing of a friend yet do the duties of a servant and that we never could make work well these half-and-half -half people are so sensitive so exacting in their demands so hard to please that we have come to the firm determination that we will have no sliding scale in our family and that whoever we are to depend on must come with bona fide willingness to take the position of a servant such as that position is in our house and that i suppose your protege would never do even if she could thereby live easier have less hard work better health and quite as much money as she could earn in any other way she would consider it a personal degradation i suppose said my wife and yet if she only knew it said bob i should respect her far more profoundly for her willingness to take that position when adverse fortune has shut other doors well now said i this woman is as i understand the daughter of a respectable stonemason and the domestic habits of her early life have probably been economical and simple like most of our mechanics daughters she has received in one of our high schools an education which has cultivated and developed her mind far beyond those of her parents and the associates of her childhood this is a common fact in our american life by our high schools the daughters of plain working men are raised to a state of intellectual culture which seems to make the disposition of them in any kind of industrial calling a difficult one they all want to teach school and school teaching consequently is an overcrowded profession and failing that there is only millinery and dressmaking of late it is true efforts have been made in various directions to widen their sphere typesetting and bookkeeping are in some instances beginning to open to them all this time there is lying neglected and despised a calling to which womanly talents and instincts are peculiarly fitted a calling full of opportunities of the most lasting usefulness a calling which ensures a settled home respectable protection healthful exercise good air good food and good wages a calling in which a woman may make real friends and secure to herself warm affection and yet this calling is the one always refused shunned contemned left to the alien and the stranger and that simply and solely because it bears the name of servant a christian woman who holds the name of christ in her heart in true devotion would think it the greatest possible misfortune and degradation to become like him in taking upon her the form of a servant the founder of christianity says whether is greater he that sitteth at meat or he that serveth 
but I am among you as he that serveth. But notwithstanding these so plain declarations of Jesus, we find that scarce any one in a Christian land will accept real advantages of position and employment that comes with that name and condition. Hmm. I suppose, said my wife, I could prevail upon this woman to do all the duties of the situation if she could be, as they phrase it, treated as one of the family. That is to say, said Bob, if she could sit with us at the same table, be introduced to our friends, and be in all respects as one of us. Now, as to this, I am free to say that I have no false aristocratic scruples. I consider every well-educated woman as fully my equal, not to say my superior, but it does not follow from this that she would be one whom I should wish to make a third party with me and my wife at mealtimes. Our meals are often our seasons of privacy, the times when we wish in perfect unreserve to speak of matters that concern ourselves and our family alone. Even invited guests and family friends would not be always welcome, however agreeable at times. Now a woman may be perfectly worthy of respect, and we may be perfectly respectful to her, whom nevertheless we do not wish to take into the circle of intimate friendship. I regard this position of a woman who comes to perform domestic service as I do any other business relation. We have a very respectable young lady in our employ who does legal copying for us, and all is perfectly pleasant and agreeable in our mutual relations, but the case would be far otherwise were she to take it into her head that we treated her with contempt because my wife did not call on her and because she was not occasionally invited to tea. Besides, I apprehend that a woman of quick sensibilities, employed in domestic service, and who was so far treated as a member of the family to share our table, would find her position even more painful and embarrassing than if she took once for all the position of a servant. We could not control the feelings of our friends. We could not always ensure that they would be free from aristocratic prejudice, even were we so ourselves we could not force her upon their acquaintance and she might feel far more slighted than she would in a position where no attentions of any kind were to be expected besides which i have always noticed that persons standing in this uncertain position are objects of peculiar antipathy to the servants in full that they are the cause of constant and secret cabals and discontents and that a family where the two orders exist has always raked up in it the smouldering embers of a quarrel ready at any time to burst out into open feud well said i here lies the problem of american life half our women like mary ann are being faded and made old before their time by exhausting endeavours to lead a life of high civilization and refinement with only such untrained help as is washed up on our shores by the tide of immigration our houses are built upon a plan that precludes the necessity of much hard labor but requires rather careful and nice handling a well-trained intelligent woman who has vitalized her finger ends by means of a well-developed brain could do all the work of such a house with comparatively little physical fatigue so stands the case as regards our houses now over against the women that are perishing in them from too much care there is another class of american women that are wandering up and down perishing for lack of some remunerating employment that class of women whose developed brains and less developed muscles mark them as peculiarly fitted for the performance of the labors of high civilization stand utterly aloof from paid domestic service sooner beg sooner starve sooner marry for money sooner hang on as dependents in families where they know they are not wanted than accept of a quiet home easy healthful work and certain wages in these refined and pleasant modern dwellings of ours what is the reason of this said bob the reason is that we have not yet come to the full development of christian democracy the taint of old aristocracies is yet pervading all parts of our society we have not yet realized fully the true dignity of labor and the surpassing dignity of domestic labor 
and i must say that the valuable and courageous women who have agitated the doctrines of woman's rights among us have not in all things seen their way clear in this matter <laughs> don't talk to me of those creatures said bob those men women those anomalies neither flesh nor fish with their conventions and their cracked woman voices strained in what they call public speaking but which i call public squeaking no man reverences true women more than i do i hold a real true thoroughly good woman whether in my parlor or my kitchen as my superior she can always teach me something that i need to know she has always in her somewhat of the divine gift of prophecy but in order to keep it she must remain a woman when she crops her hair puts on pantaloons and strides about in conventions she is an abortion not a woman come come said i after all speak with deference we that choose to wear soft clothing and dwell in kings houses must respect the baptists who wear leathern girdles and eat locusts and wild honey they are the voices crying in the wilderness preparing the way for a coming good they go down on their knees in the mire of life to lift up and brighten and restore a neglected truth and we that have not the energy to share their struggle should at least refrain from criticizing their soiled garments and ungraceful action there have been excrescences eccentricities peculiarities about the camp of these reformers but the body of them have been true and noble women and worthy of all the reverence due to such they have already in many of our states reformed the laws relating to woman's position and placed her on a more just and christian basis it is through their movements that in many of our states a woman can hold the fruits of her own earnings if it be her ill luck to have a worthless drunken spendthrift for a husband it is owing to their exertions that new trades and professions are opening to woman and all that i have to say of them is that in the suddenness of their zeal for opening new paths for her feet they have not sufficiently considered the propriety of straightening widening and mending the one broad good old path of domestic labor established by god himself it does appear to me that if at least a portion of their zeal could be spent in removing the stones out of this highway of domestic life and making it pleasant and honorable they would effect even more i would not have them leave undone what they are doing but i would were i worthy to be considered humbly suggest to their prophetic wisdom and enthusiasm whether in this new future of women which they wish to introduce women's natural god-given employment of domestic service is not to receive a new character and rise in a new form to love and serve is a motto worn with pride on some aristocratic family shields in england it ought to be graven on the christian shield servant is a name which christ gives to the christian and in speaking of his kingdom as distinguished from earthly kingdoms he distinctly said that rank there should be conditioned not upon desire to command but on willingness to serve ye know that the princes of the gentiles exercise dominion over them and they that are great exercise authority upon them but it shall not be so among you but whosoever will be great among you let him be your minister and whosoever will be chief among you let him be your servant why is it that this name of servant which christ says is the highest in the kingdom of heaven is so dishonored among us professing christians that good women will beg or starve will suffer almost any extreme of poverty and privation rather than accept home competence security with this honored name the fault with many of our friends of the woman's rights order said my wife is the depreciatory tone in which they have spoken of the domestic labors of the family as being altogether below the scope of the faculties of women domestic drudgery they call it an expression that has done more harm than any two words that ever were put together think of a woman's calling clear starching and ironing domestic drudgery and to better the matter turning to typesetting in a grimy printing office call the care of china and silver the sweeping of carpets the arrangement of parlors and sitting-rooms drudgery 
and go into a factory and spend the day amid the whir and clatter and thunder of machinery inhaling an atmosphere loaded with wool and machine grease and keeping on the feet for twelve hours nearly continuously think of its being called drudgery to take care of a clean light airy nursery to wash and dress and care for two or three children to mend their clothes tell them stories make them play things take them out walking or driving and rather than this to wear out the whole live-long day extending often deep into the night in endless sewing in a close room of a dressmaking establishment is it any less drudgery to stand all day behind the counter serving customers than to tend a door-bell and wait on a table for my part said my wife i have often thought the matter over and concluded that if i were left in straitened circumstances as many are in a great city i would seek a position as a servant in one of our good families i envy the family that you even think of in that connection said i i fancy the amazement which would take possession of them as you began to develop among them i have always held said my wife that family work in many of its branches can be better performed by an educated woman than an uneducated one just as an army where even the bayonets think is superior to one of mere brute force and mechanical training so i have heard it said some of our distinguished modern female reformers show an equal superiority in the domestic sphere and i do not doubt it family work was never meant to be a special province of untaught brains i have sometimes thought i should like to show what i could do as a servant well said bob to return from all this to the question what's to be done with her are you going to my distressed woman if you are suppose you take your distressed woman along and ask her to try it i can promise her a pleasant house a quiet room by herself healthful and not too hard work a kind friend and some leisure for reading writing or whatever other pursuits of her own she may choose for her recreation we are always quite willing to lend books to any who appreciate them our house is surrounded by pleasant grounds which are open to our servants as to ourselves so let her come and try us i am quite sure that country air quiet security and moderate exercise in a good home will bring up her health and if she is willing to take the one or two disagreeables which may come with all this let her try us well said i so be it and would that all the women seeking homes and employment could thus fall in with women who have homes and are perishing in them for want of educated helpers on this question of woman's work i have yet more to say but must defer it till another time end of chapter one what will you do with her or the woman question